Video 5 of Chapter 2, this will be our last video of Chapter 2, where we will continue exploring in-depth normal distribution calculations. In the previous video, we got to talk about normal CDF being used in our calculators to help us find the area uh, or the percentage underneath the normal curve between certain bounds, and now we will discuss some more problems. Now, there's one more idea we're going to have to do here, and there's going to be some situations where normal CDF isn't going to work. And we're going to have to talk about, well, if I can't use normal CDF, then how do I do the particular problem? So instead of asking for what percent of values are greater than or less than or between certain values, what if I now presented this question of what score would a student need to achieve to be at the 25th percentile? So earlier this chapter, we talked about percentiles as being the percent of values that fall below a certain point. And so if I'm at the 25th percentile, I have to be less than the mean. And so let's say, I don't know, I'm just going to pick a particular point here. Let's say this represents some score that I'm going to call X. But I don't know what that value is. But what I do know is what this question is posing here is that value is at the 25th percentile, percentile, which means 25% of values fall below this particular value. So think about if you were trying to use normal CDF to do this problem, what's the lower bound? Well, the lower bound would be negative infinity or negative 999. But what would the upper bound be? The upper bound would be that number you don't know. But we have a mean of 1,000 and we still have a standard deviation of 200, um, what the answer that you would be looking for from normal CDF would be the 25th percentile, the 0.25. Now, could you just guess and check your way for different upper bound values until you get 0.25 or something really, really close to 0.25? Sure, but you don't have to guess and check, okay? So there is an opposite or an inverse operation to normal CDF. Just like subtraction is the inverse of addition and division is the inverse of multiplication and squaring is the inverse operation of square rooting, the inverse of normal CDF, believe it or not, is called, uh oh, where'd my pen go? There it is, inverse norm. So if you go back to where normal CDF was, option number three is inverse norm. Now, inverse norm for your older calculator people it's only going to require you to put in three numbers. And again, they have to be separated by commas. Your newer calculator people, it'll tell you exactly what it's asking for. Now, two of the numbers are the same as before with normal CDF, the mean and the standard deviation. But instead of a lower bound and an upper bound, it's going to ask specifically for area. And we're going to have to talk about what they mean by area. Now, what I also found out very recently this year um, is that some of the newer, newer calculators uh, will also have something, I think it was called tail. And um, there's three options for tail. I think there's left, center, and right. And if you have those options, by default, we're always going to select left tail because that will be consistent with what we're going to do if you don't have that tail option, especially if you have an older calculator. You can't tell at which tail end uh, of the distribution that you want to do. So if you have one of those newer calculators that has a left, center, right tail option, we're always going to do left tail, okay? Unless you know how to figure out what that really means by left, center, and right. Then you can kind of figure that out on your own. So here's how we get to use inverse norm. When they say area, I'm going to use a different term here. And really, area represents the area to the left of that unknown value that we didn't know, x. But instead of calling it area, we're going to refer to it, or at least I will. I'm going to refer to it as the percentile. Okay? So we were at the 25th percentile, which has to be written as 0.25. So if you've got an older calculator, you're going to type in, after inverse norm, 0.25, comma, 
And then it's wanting to know what the mean is. Well, the mean was 1,000 in this particular problem. So new or older calculator people, after your comma, you're going to put in 1,000 and then put in a comma. Newer calculator people, standard deviation is 200. Older calculator people, put in 200 and then in parentheses. Newer calculator people, when you hit paste, then you're going to see exactly what the older calculator people see. And when you press enter, then you're going to get an answer. Again, two four significant digits is 865.1. So that particular score that would put you in the 25th percentile is approximately 865.1. And you might go, but I don't think you can get decimal values for a score on the SAT. And you probably can't. So do you round it to 865 or do you bump it up to 866? My recommendation is just leave it to, say, four significant digits in this case. Don't worry about necessarily rounding up or down. All right? Now, what work needs to be shown? Well, the picture's kind of tough here because you don't know what that particular value is. But if you wanted to draw a picture that illustrates that, you certainly could. What I would focus more on in this case is really the calculator command. So if I've got inverse norm and I wrote out 0.25, comma 1,000, comma 200, we obviously know the mean and the standard deviation are the last two numbers. But that 0.25, I wouldn't necessarily refer to it as the area. Now, it does represent area, but what I would want you guys to write more than anything is the percentile. Because the percentile, again, always means the area to the left. It always represents the percent of values that fall below which is always going to be to that left region. And that's that same reason why, by default, we're always going to select the left tail if you have one of those really new TI calculators. So this is the work I would want to see. The calculator command with the values and labeling percentile, mean, and standard deviation. And then you can write out what that answer is. Now, I just want to show you here what's really going on with the calculator in this case. If we were to assume a standard normal distribution, if you kind of think of standardizing our scores, if you still put in 0.25 for the area or the percentile, but you said, let's do this on a standard normal distribution basis. So if I were to type this in, or type in with my older calculator like this, I would get an answer that is negative 0 0.6745. Now, this doesn't represent the particular score on the SAT, but this represents the Z score that I would get on the SAT. Now, that remember that 865, we knew it was below the mean, because to be in the 25th percentile means you're below the 50th percentile, which is the mean, or in this case, the median. So, I get a negative z-score here. Now what you could do, and this is what the calculator really does, is it looks at that z-score formula that we've discussed this chapter, and it says the z-score would be negative 0.675, and we want to know what actual score x does that relate to when the mean is 1,000 and the standard deviation is 200. So if you were to algebraically solve for x here, guess what you would get? 865.1 approximately. So you can just put in a standard normal distribution, but the answer that it tells you initially is the z-score. And then you could do the work kind of the long way, and you could do what here? You could multiply the 200 over to the z-score, and then add the 1,000 over, and that's where you're going to get the 865.1. All right, one more example to do together here. It says, now we're going back to our SAT problem. So it says, what is the minimum score a student would need to achieve to be in the top 10% of all students? So the top 10% would be located, oh, somewhere up on this tail end, right? So I'm just going to say, I'm going to put an X right here. There's some score up here such that this region above X, this would be my top 10% of scores. So I'm just going to say, there's where I would find... 10%, my top 10%. So with a mean still of 1,000 and a standard deviation of 200. So my calculator command, inverse norm, first we need to put in the percentile. 
But in this case, we're not in the 10th percentile. If you're in the top 10%, what percent of values are below you? And that would be the 90th percentile. So we're going to put in 0.9 for the 90th percentile. Comma, 1,000 still for the mean. Comma, 200 for the standard deviation. Now, we know that score needs to be above 1,000 to be in the top 10%. So if you get something below 1,000, then you know you've done something wrong. Because if you typed in point one for the percentile, you're really going to figure out what score you would need to be in the bottom 10%. So keep in mind, if they ever mention the top 10%, you need to make sure that you're on the right side of the distribution. So I get a score of 1256.3 if I go to the nearest 10th. Now, if you gave me 1256, because that's four significant digits, hey, I'm, I'm fine with that. That's good. If you want to give me a decimal place, give me a decimal place. That's good. So again, this is the main work I would need to see to justify this answer. You want to draw a picture that illustrates what's going on in this particular problem? Awesome. I would love to see a picture to know that you really understand what's happening. Now, here's kind of a fun problem. This kind of relates back to what we did earlier with kind of the Z-score stuff. Uh, assume you scored a 30 on the ACT, which placed you at the 95th percentile. If the mean of the ACT is 22, then what's the standard deviation? Now, I'm not saying that these are legitimate numbers, that the mean really is 22, because I could see students easily going and searching and trying to find what is the standard deviation on the ACT and say, oh, I found the answer without doing any of your work. These aren't necessarily legitimate mean scores, and I'm not looking for the legitimate standard deviation ACT score. Okay, so you can try this one in addition to the other one that I had you try earlier in the video, and we'll discuss these tomorrow in class. And that is all for video four.